Hello and welcome back to The Future of Photography. This is episode 142. My name is Chris Marquardt and the whole gang is together again. Hello, Jeremiah, Adrian and Imar. How are you doing? Hi, everybody. Hi. Marvelous. Thank you. That is good. Um, yes, we, um, we have, you know, we have these little series of episodes that um, we follow every other episode or just whenever it feels right and we are doing an just a new episode or a new series of episodes and it truly is about the future of photography mm. and um we are going to cut this into bits where we look at different areas of photography and today it's about cameras so adrian why don't you pick this up and lead us into the topic Sure, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be an opportunity for wild speculation for which mm. everybody refuses to be held accountable. So what, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? That's you know? cool. it's, That's it's good. This is This is one of the, my favourite things about doing this podcast is that you could just say whatever you like, you can make it up and everything is good. Because it's, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, no such thing as a bad idea, right? Unless, of course, you're going to ship an 8K camera that doesn't actually work. But that's, that's another oh, story. That's another that story. was a burn. Oh, what a burn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is there a Canon user in the house? Oh, dear. I didn't know that. Sorry. I do, I do, have, I do have a few interesting things that I just found this week. Okay, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep going. So, no, the, 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 it is a joke. Um, uh, uh, not the camera. My, 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 what I said was the joke. Um, because it's, it's a, it's a, we live in a strange times. And, and, he, and the camera industry seems to be acting even more strangely than you might think because there's been a ton of new hardware announcements recently lots and lots of great stuff out there fantastic stuff out there all sorts of toys and gizmos and gadgets for everybody and yet all of that is set in a context of a market that is massively failing you know even without the impact of a global pandemic the market was was reducing 20 percent year on year um, and so that to me seems a, a little odd i would have expected to see maybe some consolidation i don't know i don't know or well having said that um it's already yeah, happening isn't it perhaps it is at the, at the higher level maybe not the product product level but at the company level what with olympus being sold off hopefully to stay around kodak kodak is pivoted to become a cosmetics company <laughs> i believe um only only 15 years after fuji did the same thing um so it all of this is definitely you know begs the question for me what does this mean for the future of photography and for this mini series we're setting a time horizon and we're going to speculate to a specific time horizon i'm hoping we've set it so that it's far enough away for change um but not so far away that 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 we can't imagine it in a coherent way and or so we've set of ourselves it, well yeah yeah yeah, I don't mind doing that. I mean, yeah, this is, uh, the, the, like I say, that's one of the, the benefits of doing this podcast. But it's, so, so we're setting the time horizon of 10 years and we're going to ask what do cameras look like? What does shooting look like? What do, uh, yeah, what does output look like? All sorts of things we're going to ask about the, the future of photography 10 years from now. But today we'll focus on cameras uh, because there have been a bunch of camera announcements recently and it's, it, it, I thought it'd be an interesting place for us to start so um also yeah. isn't it ironic that despite the decrease in uh the market for cameras as you've pointed out uh people have never taken as many photos as they do and have in the last few years wow. so the growth of capture is mm. insane relative oh. Are we are we speculating reaction. that it, that it's going to be accelerating and continuing with this trend, or are I we do. at one point going to I be saturated? So uh, no, I think language of visuals uh, is just e as it becomes easier and easier to manifest. Uh, so the technology will either lead or follow. But I think that. Uh, whether it's messaging, Instagramming, or some version of storytelling like that, as people um, are in many ways reading less or less literate, and I'm just speculating here, but I think that's true. There's less emphasis on um, uh, literate uh, education, shall we? I mean, maybe not in Ireland, but certainly here. Um, you know, the basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic are like things of the past. Uh, 
and, and, and so <laughs> is it that um, bad? I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that there'll be more visual. It's just a thing. It's just, just a, a thing. thing. It's it is interesting and you, radically you, different. It, it, you, you, you've conflated there, Jeremiah, right back to the first of what you said there. You've conflated the traditional camera market with the way that people take photographs today. Uh -huh. and, and, as, and as we know, those are not necessarily particularly connected anymore. And, and this is part for me, this is part of what, yeah, the, 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 the very heart of the conversation I was hoping we'd have today, because I can't imagine 10 years from now picking up a camera that looks like a dedicated camera looks today and yeah there'll be some niche stuff i'm sure mm. but yeah i can't imagine that people will be doing things in the same way and and you know do i think that everybody's going to have little drones that follow them around and are powered <laughs> by thought well no i don't not 10 years out i think that's <laughs> okay, a little let, bit far-fetched <laughs> let me let me put a question out does anyone remember what happened with digital cameras when digital photography became a thing i distinctly remember them experimenting a lot trying a lot going a lot for like weird shapes and stuff that you suddenly could do with a sensor and a, and a screen and, and a battery and most of those did not stick around most of those mm. went away and we are now in this in this entirely traditional shaped camera wave again every camera looks like a camera again um, so we already had this kind of a playful approach to the to the way cameras look and it hasn't stuck it is back that's to, a really back good point to the Chris. retro thing again that's a really mm. good point and i shoot fujis which were part of their oh, super retro is, yeah. is the, the is the retro stuff and a dial mm. for everything uh, and it, it is weird because you know broadly speaking everything comes back to a shape that you could call slr shape right mm. Broad, broadly um and and some and i think in a lot of ways that is insane I mean, that's what leads to ca uh, Canon shipping an 8K video camera that overheats in 10 minutes. I mean, it, it, the, because the, the shape of that camera is wrong for, for the functionality that they're trying to put into it. Uh, it? So it's a very strange thing. <laughs> but I, I, could make a, I could make a point about automobile design. Um, what could argue that uh, Tesla which you know is uh, arguably a uh, extraordinarily innovative car company. Um, when you look at it, it looks like a traditional car. It has a steering wheel, it has signals, and yet it has a lot of enhancements that make the experience of driving it a little bit different. Some would say very different. And so I think there is comfort in familiarity in terms of operating and how we move people uh, from a innovative design to a familiarity of usage. Uh, and a, a good example would be a TV grid. I mean, there's all manner of ways to familiarize uh, oneself with what's playing on TV. One could do a Google search, one could read magazines and whatnot. But when one looks at a TV grid, which is just boxes and text, one immediately knows how to use it. Um, a telephone, no matter if it's a rotary dial or a push button dial, we know instinctively how to use it. And so moving people to new ways of, of having a relationship with hardware is one conversation with uh, the other part of the conversation is what is the hardware capable of and what is it? What does it do? And there's that gray area like those vector graphs that intersect <laughs> is how do you move design and functionality up towards innovation in usage that moves a consumer base with it. So it's like, oh yeah, it's a camera. I, I know I don't have to study a, a complete manual uh, in order to take this picture. In other words, where's that button? I'm sure we've all experienced adapting or adopting some new piece of technology and going, well, where's the volume control or <laughs> s something basic? <laughs> uh, so it, it, innovation and movement into the future in terms of innovation has got to be coalesced around what sells 
uh, what can be manufactured, which is the other thing. Do you have to retool entire factories? And the ease of adopting from consumers. And your particular pick of the week is something that we'll talk about later, <laughs> but is a perfect example of something that seemed like a good idea, but was not. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna say yes to all of the, all of that because I think you're right. There's, there's a lot of good points in there, and I'm also gonna I, I'd really like to hear from Ema because Ema has already taken the step uh, of the four of us, probably the the furthest step away from a traditional looking camera, mm. um, and uh, arguably is is the of the four of us the one who is most stepping towards the future of photography in in the hardware sense. Sure, I agree. Um, so yeah, because I I don't I think to to consider to consider what went happened in the past with innovative digital camera designs is is good and to learn from that is good mm. to consider where we go next I, I i gotta say i don't see the camera of the future being branded as canon or nikon mm. possibly sony because they have so many fingers in so many pies but i i just don't see it i, I don't see it being like that but but emo i mean it, what's what, what's your what's your view on all of this? Well, I'm thinking about this, and I was thinking about you know how what what, way, what direction is it all going in? I feel like it, everything is going to be wearable, so I think the cameras that we have are going to be wearable. For that's in, interesting. Even in ten years, um, <clears throat> I think the kind of I watched a thing, <laughs> I watched a thing on Netflix um, lately on the. Um, suggestion of a friend of mine and it was about um it was about these sort of daredevil guys um in wingsuits um flying down mountains i think they the call them squirrels but yeah footage <laughs> that they were capturing on their helmet cams with i presume what i presume were gopros was absolutely out of this world um and and translated to this an absolutely enormous screen that to me was like a cinema screen that i was watching it on I couldn't just get over the definition of it and how everything looked. And I think as we go forward, that's more of that's going to be get even bigger. You know, everybody seems to have dash cams, um, <laughs> helmet cams uh, strapped onto them everywhere they go now. So I think it's not that far of a departure to think that, you know, I could have something attached to me when I go out for my walks that I can just you know, remotely click a button or that, you know, I, I can um, blink video. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. And it, that's not that far away, I don't think. That's um, it. Yeah. Um, I think so there's a bit of effort there. Because everything, of... as everything gets smaller, I know there's nothing quite like a big, hefty, chunky camera to hold, but um, the practicality of that, I suppose, is but then you only have one everybody. camera, don't you? So what you've talked to a little bit there is the the is the ubi ubiquity, if that's the right word, yeah. uh, of the hardware cameras everywhere. You know, one on your dashboard, one on your hat, you know, one your your wrist or something like that. You know, and one uh, in your glasses, yeah. <laughs> Wow, yeah. one on your glasses as well. Yeah, I mean that's that's an interesting thing because I thought specifically about. I think Ema, you've taken a, a thought that I had a little bit of, but you've taken it further, which is great. But the the thought I had specifically was about the glasses, and I've been, and I had a bit of an epiphany about glasses, and it was nothing to do about social acceptance, and it was yeah. everything to do about composition, because okay. if you're taking a photo with a camera that's stuck to the side of your head, yeah, you're <laughs> always going to get a shot at head height now yeah. granted you can lie on the ground but typically when you lie on the ground i don't know about you but my neck doesn't bend backwards <laughs> far enough <laughs> for me to take a photograph of anything other than the ground <laughs> like... I've, I've i've just just uh, the other day i've come across uh, some video of a guy arguing like like a, a, a guy with a with um, a fisherman and he was arguing about the spot that someone else has taken and uh, it was it was a video shot from chest height he had a body cam of sorts and it was on and it was recording and um, so you could see his hands doing things in front of the camera and it was a very interesting viewpoint 
and these cameras are there they're out there and uh, if it's it, it might just be a GoPro strapped to a little harness or it might just be something that you put in your shirt pocket and it sticks out on the top and looks at, at the front even if you go I, back to the likes of the Lytro, which was, look, you know, was kind of a big disaster or whatever. <laughs> but I mean, to take that forward and actually if the, if they actually managed to make that work on some cohesive kind of level and put it into a little small device like the size that was. But, but imagine the portability and possibility of having that attached to you. But everywhere. for this to I become think... the future of cameras, we'd have to have a big social change because people do not accept these things usually. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we also have to discuss um, uh, possibly uh, as we kind of approach it, and I, th I think uh, composition is an enormous uh, part of this uh, conversation, which is, are we just capturing um, an experience or uh, police uh, wearing body cams or dash cams. In other words, are we only interested in the information without a sense of aesthetic control or limitation that presents a point of view that is more than just, I have this experience that I'm going to share with you. Mm. It doesn't really matter if I see three more trees on both sides of the frame or, or less because mm. you're focused on me just barely uh, missing that uh, uh, mountain ledge in my squirrel suit, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, so uh, that takes your breath away. Um, and yes, but it's the experience. But in terms of control of an aesthetic, which is presenting a limited point of view, there mm -hmm. needs to be some kind of, of control for that kind of expression. Now, that's something like that can be adopted later. In other words, if I can just take a willy nilly shot, that's, you know, 20 K and, uh, we can't even really see 20 K, but when I get back to my high speed and unbelievable supercomputer at home, I just kind of like the reality that I experienced that capture in. Then I go like, okay, here's my composition and recapture it. That's a real, possibility and instead of you know running around and stopping on the street and composing it you just compose the moment by capturing it everything around it even 360 and are able to kind of flatten it or change it or, or you know panoramicize it mm. whatever and create the boundaries both are possible and we should really talk about um, architecture of cameras uh, as they diverge into that, because they seem that, to be diverging. It, that is have... a really good point, Jeremiah, because I also thought about that in the sense of a, a 360 camera, and there are plenty of 360 cameras out there today. Um, why they, um, I guess more correctly, we would call them spherical or, or nearly mm. spherical. Um, and again, I came up with the same issue I had with the the, the glasses, which is an issue of intent behind composition. So yes, mm. you can capture anything within a spherical position of where your camera is, is, but you, you still, have, you still, that's still not for me is the same, the same as composition. Um, you know, it's still, you're not making a choice there about, you know, what gets exaggerated in the mm. foreground. Um, uh, I was out a couple of days ago. Uh, we were at a place called Guildford Castle, which is a, a ruined castle in the middle of Guildford. Um, and but the flowers they plant in the grounds there were amazingly in bloom. And I, what I wanted was was the the ruined keep on the hill at the top of my shot, and lots and lots of colourful flowers in the bottom of my shot. And I was able to do that. I did it, I think, by going round behind a fence and sticking my phone through the railings and <laughs> right by the flowers and pointing it in a certain way, and you know, doing that. To or three times till I got a composition I liked and 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 all the rest of it all the rest of what actually making a photograph means rather than just doing a, a generic capture mm. and sorting mm. it out later so I, I I still think for me for me personally the the spherical thing isn't going to work either yeah I had an experience uh with uh, early uh 360 spherical cameras in storytelling um one of my colleagues at the uh, Directors Guild 
uh, was involved in an experiment and, and shared it with me so that uh, it was a, you know, a 10 minute short um, uh, that t took place in and around a playground with, uh, with a child that goes missing and, and is found, but allowed the viewer to kind of move through the playground, observe the different people there, watch the kids, watch what's happening. It was, it was compelling only for its technical ability. But I kept feeling that there was no guiding hand of the artist to be able to tell me the story. I was experiencing a reality, which again, if I could go and, and think about, well, you know, I'm thinking of going to this resort in Kyushu, and I'd really like to get a sense of what's around it. I know their advertising looks all idealized, but... Mm. Let me see it, it, what kind is there a garbage dump next door? Or, <laughs> like I, I want to know the reality. So if I put on a headset and I experience moving through an artificial reality, or actually a, a spherically captured reality that literally gave me at least the visuals, that would be very helpful to me. But it would be very different than a guided hand in terms of an aesthetic that took me through an experience. Anakin. Also, that really sounds like like that you're an avatar in a game. So the way you describe that experience just it would feel like I was playing a video game. That's like interactive TV, or is that what was that was that the? That was a brief thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, the, 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 the thing I get don't get about that though is, is where I do you put why. the lights <laughs> and the crew? <laughs> Because yeah, well, you turn uh, around. What are you going to see? Well, you're going to see all the crew, aren't you? Yeah. No, I, I I've actually <laughs> done this, Adrian, uh, where where you choose your location so that there are ditches and berms and whatnot, <laughs> and literally everybody just Duck. jumps down <laughs> into these things and come like literally holding lights and as the camera <laughs> moves away, dipping down and uh, yeah, it's a it's process. a challenge. <laughs> It is wow. a lot of effort. Yeah. You need a choreographer for your crew. Mm. It's called a director. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so point. so the, the original uh, intent of this episode was to look at the future of cameras. Um, Chris, take a run. Did we? What did, do you did, think a camera is going to look like in ten years? Um, in ten years. Yes. Not that much different from now nowadays. We'll still have two cams. We'll have the traditionalists with um, their cameras that look like cameras, and then we'll have the uh, the other side wearables. of things, the wearables and the smartphones and things. Um, that's for, for in ten years, no, no problem. If we go out further, then things will change, and cameras will be. Do you think the mirrorless thing will take over completely? Oh yeah, clearly, yeah, completely, absolutely, no yeah. doubt. Yeah, no doubt I think about so. it. Yeah, no doubt about that. No, but if if we go further, cameras will be more ubiquitous. They will be everywhere. They will be integrated into things. Society will change. Our 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 way of dealing with the whole privacy thing will probably change, and then we'll have everything shot all the time from every angle. I've I've had this in 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 another thing years ago where we talked about that. Uh, what what it will look like a hundred years out, and uh, I talked about uh, photographic archaeology where you'd have like mm -hmm. this whole this whole big blob of all the video and all the photos and everything from all sides and all angles and you would have to go in there and then dig out the photos but you could dig out mm -hmm. any photo because everything is shot from everywhere uh, from every angle um not in 10 years clearly not in 10 years mm -hmm. no so. when you extrapolate that into you know supercomputers or quantum computing and the computer is fed every image that was ever taken all images that are going on now whether and then, they, and then we'll probably not care anymore because then we'll have the super AI that has taken over. Exactly. Anyway. <laughs> you know, all the history that's ever been written, all the news and, and the computers reaching a certain consciousness, <laughs> yes. right? Because that's what it is when yes. they can process as fast as the human brain. They won't need uh, us in a while. No, the age of spiritual machines. That book is uh, was ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. but but that, that that's quite different than what we're getting at I, th I think that it's true there's going to be in 10 years cameras will look somewhat the way they look 
They might have uh, different j- capabilities, yes, but a uh, different story. Because, yeah. like for example, lenses, lens design, there may be a breakthrough in the kind of glass that may be liquid. So that the lens itself could adapt or change. I don't think mm-hmm. that's going to happen in 10 years, mm-hmm. but maybe even in 25, there'll be a way uh, so that one piece of hardware is many lenses. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about zooms. I'm talking mm-hmm. about fixed focus lenses that will adapt and morph and change mm-hmm. based on one's uh, intention. Mm. I could see that. I, I would I even also... I would even think that is likely to be there in ten years. Yes, could be. Yeah, could be. Um, uh, certainly, sensitivity is something. Um, you know, in terms of chip design, how sharp is sharp? Uh, we may be to the point where what we need to do is not increase the sharpness or accuracy of our captures, but mm-hmm. uh, have the ability to soften it to um to emulate more of how we see things infinite resolution i mean that's that's one thing that um is is we're moving towards something like that because we are already we already kind of have this with our high de- uh, with our high dpi retina screens where the resolution that we look at is virtual where we where it's so fine that you cannot really see the points anymore um unless you're like five years old and uh, and then it doesn't matter. But but now you sw- you switch into to a virtual resolution. I'm pretty sure we are going somewhere like that with cameras. So that uh, I don't know, 500 megapixels in a chip is nothing. But but you you don't need those 500 megapixels. You you'll create the virtual resolution of whatever you need. I mean that's something that is well, ten years. Yeah, I'm using not sure, a- but... AI. Uh, so I think if if we direct uh, traditional cameras to uh, a lens design that is, uh, mm-hmm. or that will be fluid, uh, and uh, and chip design that are infinite. The um, design of the actual camera uh, should probably end up to be somewhat familiar, but and because of the design, may be a little bit different. And with all that stuff under the hood, Fuji cameras will still look like they are thirty years old. <laughs> <laughs> And long may that continue. But okay, all right. So this is an interesting conversation because it's it, it's gone in a different direction from how I imagined it would be. I I've kind of got my my thinking is 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 based around two things that I see happening as trends, if you like. One one is the the trend of computational photography, uh, which we talk about a lot, of course. Um, and the second is is the trend in. Um, well, to to, to to just just to acknowledge the numbers that that far more cameras are sold in in phones or personal devices of some sort or another than they are as dedicated units. Um, so I, I'm I've got two things that I think may feature in cameras ten years from now, for uh, enabled by those two te- enabled by the two technologies. Firstly, I think I think we'll see more separation of the capture device and the composition device. Um, so what I mean by that is that um, it is simply to have two two things, two, two machines, two pieces of equipment that talk to each other. Clearly, everybody already carries a screen around with them. So, you know, by default, I can imagine that, uh, you know, your phone would be a, a fantastic monitor if you like i guess i'm borrowing here in part from from the 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 film and video industries where often the monitors are separate from the cameras Mm. Uh, i think that that has potential because as people take more and more photographs on their phones the thing that's difficult is is, when the when you're composing on a phone is that you of course the screen has to point away from your image which means you have to be directly behind the direction of shooting in order to see it um, what's nice about being able to decouple those things is that you can actually be far more physically comfortable and also far more discreet, perhaps. Uh, so mm. I think that's the thing that's going to happen. And I also think that the, uh, the 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 opposite could also be true, where the phone becomes the capture device and something like glasses or something else becomes the composing device. So because your phone 10 years from now, whatever device we carry or call call it 10 years from now, is going to have a blend of hardware and software that allows you to uh, very sophisticatedly emulate Mm. whatever you could get from any kind uh, of physical lens. 
Maybe Can not I to ask... the point where all high-end pros need it, but for the vast majority of people, that would be perfectly all right. Can I ask Emer mm. a question here? Emer, um, mm -hmm. can you see in 10 years the possibility that we will not be carrying phones? No, you're going into dystopia again. But um, no, I'm, I suppose I'm not talking about that is our... a possibility in some scenarios. I'm not saying but, um... that we won't have the ability to communicate using some device that interpersonalizes it. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But it won't look like this, right? It, 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 yeah. it won't be a brick that's like, where's my phone? Yeah. It will be something that is smaller. I always imagine. on us. Like a communicator or, you know, something small, like, <laughs> like, Star Trek like territory. <laughs> wearable. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we're going down that road anyway, aren't we? You know, I mean, they, they have become so ubiquitous to everyday life that the, the logical thing to do is to make them smaller and less conspicuous and less awkward to carry. So we'll end up with, uh, with on the other hand, badge. when they've tried That's small, okay tiny phones, people didn't like them too small. Too small. Too well, but, but that, it, that it was a problem. The screen that you... <laughs> was too small, right? If you have that built into your glasses, <laughs> then the phone can be. See, a small if you go down, already. if you go down Adrian's theory of having like um, a composition device, and then I mean your your little badge here could be, you know, the device, your sort of the communication end of it, yeah. and then the other piece of equipment could be um, just you know to use for your photography and just to make your your um, compositions and decide what you want to photograph so that I can I can and see. they could be separate from each other in that you know if you just want to talk I, to I somebody can, you yeah. just have your badge and but I could I could see out. big capture and restricted composition as two different uh, items mm. I can see that. Now I'm picturing you with a hat where they're like with a 360 <laughs> spherical camera coming out of the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> I still, so uh, this, is, I mean, this is interesting, isn't it? It is very interesting. I oh, mean, yes. I, I have to say that, you know, fo following the mainstream progression uh, at the moment, I, I still see that primarily the, the capture device of choice will be whatever passes for a personal computer. Yeah, you know, and I said, oh, pocket computer, if you want to yeah. call it that, you know, uh, yeah. or in, of the day. I think, you know, uh, and yeah, OK, that might be a slightly boring speculation because we're already there. But hey, hey, ho, it works, doesn't it? Um, but I think that the I, I think that, you know, where experiments like that Zeiss camera that had Lightroom built into it and, and those sorts of things have failed. Never had I, it. I never materialized. Think, <laughs> no. I don't think there's going to be a marketplace for dedicate a, a an economically viable marketplace for for dedicated cameras that once well, the once the 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 equivalent of phones and once the computational mm. photography gets powerful enough other you know many i would predict speculate most amateur photographers yeah. who let's face it are the heart of that market mm. are, are going to walk away from their dedicated cameras mm. or they'll become okay. collectors items let me ask you a question Hypothetically, mm -hmm. you've just got a new job. You're making a ton of money. You've just been appointed the head of design for Nikon <laughs> or Nikon, as you're going to say. Okay. Well, I'm making, I'm making, I'm making cosmetics now, am I? <laughs> <laughs> the question, you've just come into the office. Here's your team. And it's like, OK, guys, here's what we have to aim for in 10 years. We're going to develop what so that you know what is, is it a sign question. that uh, like those companies have gone towards things like so radically different like cosmetics that they the people um sitting around in their think tanks haven't got a clue what's going to happen in the next 10 years that they can't you know it seems really strange that they would go so far away from their own field and not try to jump on board with um whatever is coming down the road or try to help develop it I in mean, some way I mean, the, the one thing that I see is um, if you look at how fashion works, how the style of cloth and the style of shoes is, it doesn't really like happen. It's more defined by these companies and then mm. marketed and then they know two years in advance what colors will be the colors of the summer. 
because mm. um, they need to prepare, they need to buy, they need to produce, they need to be ready, they need to market everything. And I, I see something similar happening in the camera industry because the, I know, I, I used to work in the computer industry, I know that the, the next printer, fax, copy machine that would replace all the other stuff that was sold individually um, was ready 10 years in advance. It was in the labs, they had it running, they just didn't sell it because they didn't want to ca cannibalize their printer market, their fax market, their whatever. So. Sure. So I'm, I'm pretty sure these guys know what's going to happen in 10 years because they're already building it now. They're testing it. Mm. They're, they're farming it out to testers, um, maybe in early prototypes. But um, the, the development but, cycles in these things are relatively long. We're looking so, yeah. at an Apple product being, being five years in, a, in, the, in the development queue. So I'll, I'll so, give you that for one of the current major manufacturers. I'd say Sony are capable of that. I, and I you think say, the others are all reactive? Uh, I'd say Nikon probably at this point, as much as I love Nikon, they're probably too small to survive. Uh, I'd say because they don't have the diverse portfolio that Fuji and, and Kodak had, um, you know, so uh, or, or the sheer scale of Canon. Um, I, so I, I am very worried about Nikon uh, because I, I don't think I don't see anything from them that that, that stems the tide. Uh, so, yeah, so that, that sounds like a, a slow, agonizing death. Um, what I envision is more like something will come along that no one really has on the radar right now that will disrupt this entire thing. And, and that, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's what I. That's what I mean. I, I, so, if I look across the the the, you know, the large camera manufacturers right now, um, there are there are some that can afford to have a space in a niche market. And Fuji, I would count in that because they're such a large corporation that do other things as well. There are some that I think are part, so intrinsically part of the manufacturer of devices that they're gonna stay there. Sony being the obvious one makes the census for everybody. Um, others, I think, you know, they others, others I think are, are at risk. So I don't, I don't know that the, ca I don't know that the camera I'm gonna shoot in 10 years time it ha has a badge on it that is the name of a current camera manufacturer. Do you think that that companies that work in, for example, defense or uh, the space program, et cetera, uh, will through their R&D and discovery create that oh, breakthrough in what we were talking about before, lens design or capture design. Uh, it certainly won't be ergonomic design, but but because that is really, that will come to adapt those things. But it, you know, when you talk to, about photography, really what you're talking about is the ability to capture light through what we now see as glass or fluorite, whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, you could you could draw uh, quite easily. You could draw a line from JFK through to camera bags, um, because simply through the invention of Velcro, you know. <laughs> so, like, um, you know so it is it is true that, that these huge initiatives based around science and engineering do pay off for photographers. <laughs> it's like, so. Uh, but but I don't I, I don't know the simple answer to your question Jeremiah is I don't know because I'm not connected enough to that world to know except to know what's my going question on. really is what would you like to see now that you're running the innovation labs at uh, <laughs> Nikon and they're on life support according to mm. you uh, you have another year or so to at least redirect the company and you have unlimited resources what would you ask for. Uh, that it, it's oh, a really that, good question. That's a mean one. Think, that's a mean one. <laughs> it's, no, and I, I, I'll take a fair, I'll take a punt at you know, at answering it because I think you know I I I feel that if I'm going to say things like I'm very worried about Nikon, I'm not I'm not condemning them in any way or no. wanting to say that they're doing bad things. So I hope that's not what's coming across. What I'm coming no, no. across is that I love the products they make and I'm worried that they won't exist anymore. Yeah, they'll be. And I would say to them, you've got to tap into. You, you, you've got to tap into something that is going to have some legs over the next decade. Now, you know, we've made jokes about Kodak becoming a cosmetics company today, but if you read the history of what happened to Kodak and what happened to Fujifilm at the end of the film era and the rise of the digital era, people say, very often say, it's kind of a, an, an urban myth, if you like, that, that Kodak failed to take decisions. That's really not true. 
really not true. Kodak made lots of investments into digital technologies. They misread the market and it turned out that they basically lost money hand over fist. Um, and But it, it's certainly not true that they didn't take decisions. They did and they made lots of investments. But sadly, nobody really wanted to go down to their local chemists to, to use a computer in a box to get a CD-ROM. And they, <laughs> and they also but, had a, a cash cow yeah. business, which was film. And it was so big that the, the other stuff never really got the attention that it should have had. Yeah, well, I, I, I've, read, I've read that story as well. Of course, we all have. I, I, I don't know. And, and I wasn't there, so I can't call it. But, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's for lack of trying. Oh Whereas no no! Fuji they they they, they built the first uh, digital SLR. They were exactly. Um, they, exactly. They they were they were forerunners. Absolutely, they were. And uh, exactly. Whereas what what Fuji, one of the things that Fujifilm did is they went back to their base scientific and engineering knowledge. They looked at their portfolio of technology and knowledge, and they realised that actually some of their chemical knowledge was very valuable in the cosmetics industry. And that is why today a huge range of cosmetics produced globally have chemicals in them, base, base chemicals, base elements that come from Fujifilm. Uh, scary, and that was, what, that was <laughs> what allowed Fuji to survive, even though the film production market was, was you know, sinking into the swamp. Well, K Kodak so, has just received another lifeline because exactly. they, they've just received three quarters of a million dollars from... Uh, from the U.S. government because they are now going into yeah you said cosmetics I billion think it's, it, billion yeah it's yes. it's it's almost uh, it's almost uh, I, th I think it's more like a medication stuff that is traditionally produced in India and China that they want to bring back home something like that something I'm, I'm, like I'm that. no doubt getting it horribly wrong and <laughs> listeners please correct me um, I but but the, but but it's it, it's it's the right direction and uh, and yeah there, there's a pivot. Happening. Also, it is. Uh, yeah, early to the market. I mean, uh, how many of us are using Casio cameras today? <laughs> Good call. I haven't Good seen point. one in years. No, uh, but but Casio is one of the first consumer-based, uh, you know, three hundred K digital cameras with a little micro. Uh, that, My first that, digital camera was an HP. I was yeah, yeah I mine was because I used to work for HP in those days. I remember I did, when yes. HP manufactured <laughs> yeah. companies. Uh, cameras, sorry, um, but uh, yeah. So, so the, there's a, there's a lot going on here. But I, I think yeah, I I, I, ex I expect cameras to become more modular in that sense. In that, that you know, whichever way you choose to do it, I think there'll be, I think you'll have a mainstream of people using whatever is their device of choice on the day, which clearly will have lots and lots of powerful computational mm -hmm. photography built into it. And enthusiasts might have add-ons like glasses or I don't know a Bluetooth shutter button. <laughs> oh, oh no, I've already got one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could I could very much see uh, uh, cameras being ordered much the way we we uh, buy cars, which is you know here's the box or or the device. What do you want on it? Uh, this oh. kind of innovated glass, okay. this kind of well, of isn't it chip, already the, there in the video world? Close. Look at there, red. Look at red. The, the, you you yeah. you pick you pick your camera. You piece it together from different elements. Yeah, I'd say that, you know, the knock uh, on red, of course, and, you know, use them for since they started was we always uh, used to say that red is a computer with a lens on it. Yeah. And w when you're shooting, uh, the capture and the, the result is absolutely beautiful. But the process, unlike the Ari Alexa, doesn't feel like a camera. It feels like a computer with a lens on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's like menus. By the way, it's my knock on Sony cameras. I think Sony is, you know, they have beautiful lenses and they have beautiful um, chipsets and, and the, the work is really, really nice. But you have to be an engineer to scroll through the menus to make it kind of instinctive for me. Not, not, not saying that that is for everyone, but, but for me, it doesn't feel intuitive. Um, you know, so, but, but, uh, so I think there's that disconnect between the engineers who are innovating in one way, the designers, the marketers and the, uh, end user. And so I, I, I think, uh, we have a long way to go before we figure out 10 years from now, what a good experience would be. So, so 45 minutes into this episode, do we know we have what no idea. camera's <laughs> going to look like in 10 years? <laughs> maybe, maybe we should just split this up here and uh, go into our picks of the week. Oh, so, 
Okay. Yeah, which 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 makes perfect sense. So let's see, Adrian, how about you? Oh, I've got a great one here. My my pick of the week is a newly released camera from Sony. Uh, <laughs> is it it's newly got, released? It, <laughs> <laughs> it, may, it may not even have hit the markets yet. It may not even have hit the <laughs> shops yet. But this, this 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 year's Christmas win will be the the, the Sony QX10 or maybe the QX100 if you want the one with the longer zoom lens. I think this is this is the epitome of what I think cameras ten years from now will look like. Oh. Now the, clearly this is a, a isn't, blast. Isn't from this the like past. about ten years old? Uh, yeah. Not quite. I think I think from my from my reading, 2013, these okay. cameras were launched, and they were launched as companions to phones, where your oh. capture device would be a separate device from your phone. And yes, you could use it, um, uh, you could, the capture device just on its own, just as point and shoot, but it had no user interface essentially, other than a shutter button. <laughs> um, mm. So uh, I I think this is what's missing from mobile phone photography because as i get older it's slightly more challenging to throw myself into the ground to the <laughs> ground or contort into weird positions <laughs> to get the image if i could just like grab the grab the camera the lens in my other hand and, and just shove that through the railings of the fence instead uh, that'd be much easier <laughs> yeah. as someone who who actually was so excited when this came out that i went and bought it i i would say this uh particular combination of lens and iPhone was one of my biggest regrets. <laughs> uh, I, I, it quickly became completely impractical. So if I wanted to shoot something, I needed to clip it onto the phone. Oh, it doesn't work with every phone case. So I had to get a new phone case. Then you have to connect it with Bluetooth. <laughs> then then uh, talk about ergonomics or lack thereof. Uh, by the time I, I, I actually got to use it, uh, and you know, I, I forget what the um, sharpness or the megapixel strength. It had a little mini card in it, but I, I could have gotten out my four by five, set it up on the <laughs> tripod, loaded the film, <laughs> and put it in. Developed it. Yeah, you could have ground the glass yourself, couldn't you? <laughs> and and uh, it just—it was a good idea, but it wasn't. Uh, intuitive enough no so 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 i am imagining that this is uh they, they have another go at it um uh and that the technology that we have available to us 10 years from now and uh, uh you know can iron out all of those creases that you experienced <laughs> sure. to make it a, a you know a, a, a lot more maybe um, they learned something from it so <laughs> yeah. jeremiah what is your pick of the week uh i picked uh, just the uh, overall subject of uh, lookup tables or LUTs, as mm -hmm. they're called. Um, I'm a big fan of them, both in film and photography. I just posted an article on them. Uh, but uh, I, I do feel in innovative uh, camera design, there will be the ability to capture a LUT. And by that, I mean capture what we call in, in 3D um, creation uh, HDRIs, which are the capture of light and color. Um, and it's it's not a preset. It it really does read the entire kind of body of reflectivity and, and color and density and vibrance, and be able to quickly apply it to uh, whatever shoot whatever we want. So if we we see an image, we can just capture it. We can, and then we can emulate that look and feel within our own um, photography. And this is <laughs> someone who primarily works in black and white so it's ironic i'm talking about this but but uh color work is um with lots as something that uh photoshop has been it's one of the hidden beauties of photoshop that you can actually use lots to color time uh one's images and it really makes a beautiful beautiful um difference uh, other than uh, looking at presets which are very very different so um i think the use of LUTs and how we apply them to the end game is something that I believe will be integrated into cameras of the future. All right. I will go right. next and I'll pick an event that is coming up. It's called Out of Chicago in Depth. Um, Out of Chicago is a series of um, photography conferences that 
They have been around for a while with a destination conferences as well out of uh, out of Moab, out of Acadia, for example. Chris Smith from Chicago is is the one who's masterminds this and he is created an, a virtual online event um starting on august the 21st to the 23rd then there's a week of assignments and then there's a epic group image reviews and the reason i'm talking about it is because i am one of the 60 some teachers on that event i'm an instructor there i'm teaming up with valerie jardin who's a, an awesome street photographer. And we are holding a four hour session together about limitation in photography. And uh, she's uh, covering the digital side and I'm covering the analog side. So um, that event is up uh, on outofchicago.com. And it is, um, yeah, it starts on the 21st and uh, there's a promo code. <laughs> Shamelessly misusing this episode for this. There's a promo called Chris and you get $50 <laughs> off if you join. And um, I think it's worth it. So, yeah. Really Sounds well. like a lot of fun, actually. Oh, it, it is. It's going to be amazing. I mean, there's 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 people on there that I'm really in awe of. Um, lots of great, great photographers. So, yeah. Cool. So, Imer, last but yeah. not least. Uh, this, uh, my pick of the week came from something I was watching, um, a photographer actually talking about this and I had to go and look it up. And I was thinking about more you guys than me because I don't really, um, I don't really use my camera and <laughs> never mind my flash. <laughs> so um, it's like, um, these are magnified modifiers that just pop on to the front of your flash and you can stack them up and like, modular like you like Adrian I was thinking of your studio photography um just thought it was a really clever idea and um not something I'd ever use myself but I'm sure there's tons of people out there who would benefit from this especially actually the part the photographer I was watching was, was talking about um shooting things like weddings and she said that um it was just amazing in terms of just how quickly it allowed her to work. So if you're in, in that kind of situation, sure, it's lovely. I just think it's a really lovely looking piece of kit. It and, is um, a lovely looking piece of kit yeah. and, I, and I've actually used them. I've actually played with them. Okay. So magmods yeah. are, it's it's like, yeah, this magnetic. Like they could become kind of invaluable and they're quite yep. um, compact again in, in that nice way. And it fits yeah. on it fits on every flash and you mm, just click mm. on whatever filter or, or honeycomb grid or whatever mm. you want. Pretty yeah, cool so stuff. Yeah, very, very cool product. That's it. All right. I think that is it for this episode um, again we're on video so um, check out our youtube we will link to that in the show notes so it just this is just a tap away as a video episode you can see us in our little bubbles and uh we'll be back in a week from now with another episode about well let's let's something. find out what's <laughs> something let's find out <laughs> shall we um you can find us on the web at the future of photography we have a card for that look the future of photography.com we're on twitter at tfob now and on insta at tfob now until then everyone take care and bye-bye bye everybody bye. Bye.